What are some of the biggest mistakes that have cost millions or even billions of dollars? Let's get right to it and find out, starting with number four. Kurt Schilling loses his entire $50 million fortune. In 2022, former baseball pitcher Kurt Schilling tweeted a scathing criticism of President Joe Biden's student loan debt forgiveness program. The program would provide former students from $10 up to $20,000 to pay off their student debt, but only for those who earned less than $125,000 a year, or a household making less than $250,000. Schilling went on a rant, saying that the plan isn't forgiving loans, but enabling lazy young people to continue to be, well, lazy, all at the expense of, quote, hardworking, debt-paying Americans. He also called the younger generation, though he didn't specify which one, a bunch of unaccountable and uneducated children. Surely some people may have agreed with the former World Series champion, but many others pointed out that Kurt Schilling was the last person who should be criticizing people for not paying their debts. Before we get to Schilling's hypocritical financial failures, let's get some background on the former ace. In case you're not familiar with who he is within the professional sports community, Kurt Schilling spent his career playing baseball, specifically pitching as a starter for a few teams. But the team he is most commonly associated with is the Boston Red Sox. Schilling was their ace for several seasons, two of which resulted in the Red Sox winning the World Series, baseball's Super Bowl. During his tenure as the top pitcher for one of the league's top teams, Schilling was paid $115 million. When he retired, and after taxes, he was worth around $50 million, all from his baseball contracts and endorsements. Schilling used his money to invest in a video game company, 38 Studios, 38 being the jersey number Schilling played with during his baseball career. Schilling loves video games. His favorite game is World of Warcraft, a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. It was Schilling's goal to make and sell a game similar to World of Warcraft for his gaming studio. To help fund his company, Schilling took out a $75 million loan from Rhode Island's Economic Development Corp., a government-owned company similar to government-run universities. In exchange for this rather large loan, Schilling promised to move his company to Providence, Rhode Island and create 450 new local jobs. Everything started out smoothly. Schilling moved 38 studios to Providence, 75 million in hand and also the 450 jobs with potential for more employment in the future this future employment was dependent on 38 studios growing into a big profitable company after all it was being helmed by a famous name which is always a good thing for a company to have unfortunately the company launched in 2012 a bad time for businesses the economic recession wasn't quite done healing yet and it didn't help that the company wasn't making money hardly any money at all Gamers weren't impressed with the game setting the story behind the gameplay, making it a boring game overall. That same year, 38 Studios failed to pay a $1.1 million payment to one of their creditors. Then, later that same month, had to let go of 400 of their employees. They simply couldn't pay them their wages. In fact, the studio had completely missed two payrolls. Eventually, 38 Studios was forced to shut down, and Schilling had to file for bankruptcy. Things got so bad that Schilling had to start selling off some of his most prized possessions and keepsakes from his baseball career, including his famous bloody sock he wore during one of his starts. Schilling was hoping the sock would sell for $400,000 at auction, however, the sock only ended up pulling in $90,000. All in all, Schilling ended up losing his entire fortune to his business which was consumed by his massive debt to the government. Too bad he ticked off the only people with whom he can empathize. Number three, Citibank's accidental transfer, $900 million. That's how much money cosmetic company Revlon owed international bank Citigroup in 2020. Funny thing was, the 900 million wasn't meant for Revlon and was sent to them by accident, according to Citigroup. Instead of sending the money back, however, Revlon and their creditors kept the money. They then used the accidental funds to pay off Revlon's massive debts. Over the past few years, Revlon has been going through bankruptcy. Unfortunately, the cosmetics giant filed during the lockdown, and their asset liquidation process was slowed almost to a complete halt, meaning Revlon couldn't transport their products and other physical assets to buyers. Imagine one of those furniture stores where everything must go sales not being able to ship their furniture to customers, and you'll get an idea of what Revlon was going through. Along with Revlon, the investment firms who had poured money into the black hole that was Revlon took some of the money Citigroup sent. That's not to say they literally took the money. In fact, 
Revlon had spent some of the money paying them back. The investment companies, which included firms Symphony Asset Management, HPS Investment Partners, and Brigade Capital Management, were able to get some of their money back from Revlon. They didn't care too much where it came from or how they got it, as long as it was legal. And technically, the money they received from Revlon was legal tender. But when Citigroup asked for their money back and only got roughly 400 million, they decided to take legal action to retake the rest. By the time they brought their suit to court, the remaining balance of $500 million was spread over the Revlon lenders. The lenders, of course, still refused to hand over the money they received from Revlon, who'd gotten it from Citigroup, lots of money moving. Citigroup argued that Revlon willingly accepted their money even though they had to have known it was sent to them accidentally. In response, Revlon had denied their argument while also refusing to acknowledge Citigroup's right as a secured lender. Essentially, they were saying Citigroup doesn't count as a lender to them. The other lenders, who were basically bailed out by Citigroup, make the same claims. If the suit fails, Citigroup may be out half a billion dollars, and it's very likely they will indeed lose the remaining money they accidentally gave to Revlon. Since the money was given willingly and Revlon never requested the money as a loan, it will be difficult to force the company and the investor companies to give it back in a court of law. If that's indeed what happens in the coming years, then Citigroup's goofy mistake will be one of the most catastrophic in recent history. Number two, Nike's Steph Curry mistake. Back when he played in college, Stephen Curry was seen as just another talented guard poised for the NBA draft, with no guarantee of success. He's six foot three, and at the time of the draft, skinny and wiry. Not exactly a freak athlete, especially by NBA standards. Nike apparently felt the same way, even after Steph became a star on the team that drafted him out of college, the Golden State Warriors. They courted him, like many other players before him, to sign on for a shoe deal. Nearly two-thirds of every player in the NBA are signed to Nike in some apparel-related capacity. At the time, Steph was a rookie, but a promising rookie nonetheless. He was a deadly accurate sharpshooter who had the chance to become a top tier scorer in the league. Still, that's about as great as anyone thought Steph Curry would ever get. No one, including Nike, imagined Steph leading a world-class sports dynasty or completely changing the way professional basketball was played. No one except his father, Del Curry. Dell remembers attending a meeting with Nike that made him realize the company didn't fully appreciate his son's talent and potential, potential that was still in development. Steph entered the league in 2009. In his first few years as an NBA guard, Steph did pretty well. His points per game average in his rookie year was 17, which is really impressive for a rookie. The next year, Steph increased his average by one point per game. However, in the next year, Steph only averaged 14 points per game. In his fourth year, he overcame prior setbacks such as his ankle problems and averaged 22 points per game. Despite Steph's somewhat steady improvements, the league and fans didn't view the young sharpshooter as a superstar. He hadn't even made the all-star team yet. Nike held the same sentiments as fans did. In 2013, Steph's contract with the company was up for renewal, but they didn't seem all that interested or concerned with making sure Steph signed back on with the swoosh. According to Dell, that is. When he visited the Nike company with Steph to negotiate his son's new contract, he recalls being very disappointed at the way they treated the deal. Fun fact, Del Curry is a former NBA star and has years of experience in the sports business. He knows when a company respects you and when they do not. The sign of disrespect occurred within the first moments of the meeting, says Dell, when one of the Nike executives pronounced his son's name Stefan instead of the correct name Stefan. Dell felt the executives could at least have done some research before they met him and Steph. He said he's used to people mispronouncing Steph's name. It was the fact that they didn't correct their mistake that showed a lack of due diligence and therefore respect. Dell says the meeting only got worse from there. The Nike executives were supposed to present a sales pitch to Steph and Dell, but one of the PowerPoint slides they showed depicted NBA superstar Kevin Durant. The Kevin Durant slide was an accident, but further annoyed and disappointed Del Curry. He says he stopped paying attention after the Durant incident. Though he managed to keep a poker face for the remainder of the meeting, Del had already decided he would advise his son to leave Nike. Steph agreed and decided to receive offers from other shoe companies. Oddly enough, that didn't necessarily mean that Nike couldn't sign Steph back if they wanted to. In their contract with Steph, Nike had written a clause stating that if they matched any offer from any other company, that outside offer would immediately become null and void. In other words, if Nike was willing to match other offers for Steph's sneaker rights, then he'd have to accept their offer. It wasn't the worst contract stipulation. 
After all, Nike is almost every young basketball player's dream endorsement company, but not for Steph. He and his father knew he had a great future and wanted to work with a company who saw that. Under Armour, a smaller competitor of Nike, offered Steph a deal. Nike was aware of the offer, but declined to match it. With all their resources, matching Under Armour's offer would have been a drop in the bucket for Nike. Under Armour's offer was only $4 million a year. That's not a lot of money to a company who pays out nine-figure deals to stars like Michael Jordan and LeBron James, who received a $500 million offer from Nike at the peak of his career. Still, they decided to let Steph go. The season after they let Steph go, the baby-faced assassin, as fans began to call him, went on a three-point shooting spree. His points per game average went up to 24 and earned Steph his first All-Star appearance. Then 2016 happened. Steph averaged a league-leading 30 points per game and also won an NBA championship. On basketball courts across America, from cracked concrete playground courts to polished hardwoods, amateur players tried to imitate Steph's signature move, the quick-release step-back three. Many other players started shooting like Steph, but the now common move will forever be associated with the baby-faced assassin. Suddenly, Steph was the hottest player in basketball, rivaling even LeBron James in popularity, and his shoes, now designed and manufactured by Under Armour, were flying off the shelves. Reports say their sales grew to 350%. They've been one of Under Armour's biggest sellers ever since, and helped launch the company into the collectible sneaker market and of course, made them millions and millions of dollars, dollars that Nike didn't make. Number one, University of Florida and Gatorade. The University of Florida's mascot is an iconic blue, orange, and green alligator. If you've ever watched college football, basketball, or baseball, you've probably seen it before. But there's one more logo associated that you've definitely seen at some point in your life, even if you didn't know it was connected to the University of Florida, the Gatorade logo. In fact, the iconic sports drink you've enjoyed during Little League games and pickup basketball meetups was actually invented at the University of Florida. In 1965, the Florida Gators football team was attempting to run their summer practice program, but one problem kept slowing them down, the swampy Florida heat. If you've never been to Florida during the summer, you should know that it's like the inside of a sauna from sunup to sundown. Players smothered in heavy pads and uniforms were passing out nearly every day from heat exhaustion in 100 plus degree heat. The coaches were stumped. The cool water they were providing their players simply wasn't keeping them properly hydrated. In other words, they were sweating more than they were drinking. Eventually, the football coaches approached the university's medical department and asked if they could come up with a solution to this sweat-infused problem. Four of the teachers in the department started working on a drink that would help keep the players hydrated by giving them a higher concentration of the chemicals that aided in hydration, such as carbs and electrolytes. The group also burdened themselves with the even more difficult task of making the drink taste good. These scientists were led by Dr. Robert Cade, who directed Dr. Jim Free, Dr. Dana Shires, and Dr. Alex de Casada. The team scientists eventually came up with Gatorade because it, well, aided the Gators football team. This success story has been told many times by the Gatorade brand, how their drink helped the sweaty, red-faced football players not pass out during practice and become a more efficient and, most importantly, healthy team. Then, of course, the university scientists started selling their drink to other schools and then, eventually, to everyone else in the world. What they don't often tell you about Gatorade's association with the school is how they abandoned the rights to the Gatorade brand, leaving it all to the scientists who created it. Still, the school essentially funded their research. Not to mention, their school mascot is in the company name. You'd think the University of Florida would have a sizable stake in Gatorade, but they don't. The four scientists slash teachers offered to give the rights to the school, but the school said they didn't want it. At the time, Gatorade was just an invention used by Florida athletes, and not the multinational corporation it is today. The drink had been praised by the Florida Gators football team, who credited Gatorade with helping them win the coveted Orange Bowl in 1967. Still, it was hard for anyone to imagine what they would become, even the school that created it. Today, Gatorade is defined by its electrolytes and the array of flavors we all love, with cool names no one ever uses. They've become so common, we simply say, I'd like the blue Gatorade. Every grocery store, convenience store, and most concession stands in America sell Gatorade usually earning the company around $200 to $250 million per year. 
There's even a ceremonial tradition that teams perform after they win a championship called the Gatorade Shower, where the players pour an entire tub of Gatorade on their head coach. But back in the 60s, Gatorade was primarily a drink of the Gators. After the Orange Bowl victory in 67, Dr. K decided he would sell the rights to Gatorade back to the Florida Gators. He offered the rights to the university for $10,000. In today's currency rate, that $10,000 was around $75,000. Still, Gatorade was a product with immense potential, but the University of Florida still wasn't interested. Dr. Cade proverbially shrugged his shoulders and began approaching other buyers. After some negotiations, Dr. Cade struck a deal with Stokely Van Camp, selling 100% of the company to them for a much larger sum of $1 million, which is roughly around $7.5 million today. The company also gave Dr. Cade and the other doctors royalties on every gallon of Gatorade sold. In the hands of Stokely Van Camp, Gatorade quickly became a powerhouse brand, especially after they paid $25,000 to be the official drink of the NFL. Revenues skyrocketed so high that nearly everyone had heard of Gatorade, including the University of Florida. In 1971, the school suddenly wanted Gatorade back. According to Dr. Cade's biography, he was told by the Florida Gators that Gatorade belonged to them, and all the royalties, even the ones owned by the four doctors who'd invented the drink, belonged to them as well. Unfortunately for the university, their case was weak, especially considering most of the funding for the production of Gatorade came from a federal grant. Nevertheless, the lawsuit only lasted three grueling years. In the end, the university received a settlement in 1972 that granted them a 20% stake in Gatorade's revenue. Today, they've earned well over $200 million in revenue, with an average annual payment of $20 million. The four doctors who actually created Gatorade didn't fare too bad either. Between the four of them, they earned a combined $1.1 billion. $200 million is a large sum, but nothing compared to the potential billions they could have made from owning the entire Gatorade brand. Click to watch one of these next videos, and let us know in the comment section what you'd rather drink for hydration, Gatorade or any other drink of your choice.